Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The general just fell out of bed. His name? William Scott Ketchum, Major General, United States Army, retired. So that there'll be no mistake, this is the same William Scott Ketchum who led the famed Ketchum's Raiders against the Seminoles in 1842, who was acting Inspector General of the Department of the Missouri, and the one who did such a bang-up job of recruiting in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania during the Civil War. The general is in agony. In protest against the quick ebb of his life, he's kicking the floor. The general is dead. And tonight, my transcribed report to you on the final day of General Ketchum and how he died. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now once again, Thomas Highland. Eighteen hundred and seventy-one. The place is Baltimore, Maryland. The month, June. No poet in the world, to my knowledge, has ever written a poem about this month in Baltimore. It is hot, it is humid, and the oysters are not in season. And any almanac will show you that in June, eighteen hundred and seventy-one, had oysters been in season, with eggs and breadcrumbs, they could have been fried on the sidewalks. For most Baltimoreans, it was the season for dipping hands into tepid scrub water to wash the marble stoops. It was the season for sleeping on back porches and Druid Hill Park, the time of sweat and the hand fan, and the usual quota of elderly stout folk dropping dead from the heat. In short, it was a time to get out of there. In a certain house near Charles Street, a lady was preparing to do just that. Her name? Mrs. Wharton. And she was packing to go to Europe. Coming, 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 coming. General. Mrs. Wharton. How nice. How very pleasant. Do you come in? Do. May I present Mrs. Chubb? Delighted. Oh, do come in, you and the general. I've been cooling myself with iced dandelion wine. Do join me. I do not imbibe. I work for the United States Department of the Treasury. Mrs. Chubb needs to keep a clear head at all times. I used to work for the United States Post Office Department, but now I'm with the Treasury. My, that's interesting. And you came all the way from Washington with the general. Perhaps your next position will be with the Army. My dear Mrs. Wharton, I must talk to you. Of course. Uh, will you pardon us, Mrs. Chubb? Is this where you talk to her about the money she owes you? Mrs. Chubb. $2,600. Isn't that what you told me, General? Why don't you pay the General his money, Mrs. Wharton? Mrs. Wharton? Yes? As long as the cat is out of the bag, I thought to bring along the note you signed. I understand you're going to Europe. Get the money, dearie. Why, I have a distinct recollection, General, of having reimbursed She's going to tell you she's paid you the money. Let's not embarrass each other. But there's really no hurry, is there? There's no train back to Washington for hours. Wouldn't you like some wine? I do not imbibe. Just a small glass? You just sit down and relax. I'll bring you the wine and we'll chat. You might stop at the cookie jar, too, dearie, for the $2,600. The 
The heat in Baltimore wasn't bad enough, but what the only breeze was an ill wind that blew in from Washington. From the point of view of Mrs. Wharton, that is. It should be remarked that Mrs. Wharton was no chicken. She was 50 years old and at an age when petty tribulations could easily bring on an attack of the vapors. Now consider. Here she was packing to go to Europe, and if you remember, just a moment ago, she was happily singing. Now descends upon her people who ask her for money. Certainly conducive to vapors, if anything was. But Mrs. Wharton, true to the noble tradition of Baltimore women, of whom I might mention the fabulous Eulalie Bracken, the belle of the Rappahannock, did not permit herself the vapors under duress. Instead, she went directly to her wine cabinet. Right here, and for the next ten minutes, history only serves up to us a vacuum. We do know, however, that when Mrs. Wharton returned to her guest, carrying a goblet of wine for the general, this remark was made. What took you so long, Mrs. Wharton? Did you stop at the cookie jar, dearie? General? Your health, ladies. And yours, General. Oh, my, yes. <sighs> General! What are you doing on the floor, General? Uh, I can't get up, Mrs. Chubb. Please. What is it, General? Uh, call a physician. I'm ill. my patient now. Feeling better? Uh, Dr. Chu? Yes? You must do something for me. Anything, anything, General. Convey to Mrs. Wharton my apologies. Tell her I'm so ashamed of myself for falling down on her rug. And tell Mrs. Chubbs to find a room in town. And Dr. Chu? Anything, anything, General. Tell Mrs. Chubb to stay there. Of course. General? Yes? You know what's wrong with you? What? Well, I don't know. I thought perhaps you did. I thought perhaps you had had a previous diagnosis. I thought perhaps this was a recurring ailment. I haven't ailed a day in my life, except... Out with it. Except when I was in the swamp chasing the Seminoles. Then I was sick most of the time. Ah. Yes? In the swamps. Cholera. Cholera morbus. And your present symptoms. Sweating, purplishness, weakness, and debility. Cholera morbus recurrent type. Is that very serious? Rest easy. I have the very thing in my bag. You're going to feel like a new man as soon as you take this. By looking stuff. Why is it that all you army men quail at the sight of medicine? Here. Drink this, General. No, I'm not going to drink it. General, come on, open. I don't want to drink it. General. There's some more. Drink it. What kind of medicine was that? Creosote and lime water. How do you feel? It seems... Uh, yes? Suddenly, the foreignness is gone. Good. Very good. May I get up now? Oh, no. You'll be in bed until tomorrow, at least. I'll have Mrs. Wharton fetch you a prescription, which will work wonders. Goodbye, General. Mrs. Wharton... I have a message for Mrs. Chop. Where is she? Must I reveal? Well, I do have a message for her. She imbibed. She can't stop. She's in the rose garden now. I can't get her out of there. But then... Tell her to take a room and stay there. General's orders. And how is the general? He says his furriness is gone. Splendid. I gave him a palliative, a temporary relief. Is he seriously ill? He isn't young anymore, you know. There are no small sicknesses when one gets to be his age. And I'm afraid he can't be moved. He'll have to stay here at your house. But of course, he can stay in my room. I'll use the guest room. And an errand for you, Mrs. Wharton, to the druggist. Get some tincture of yellow jasmine and give him a tablespoonful every two hours. Tincture of yellow jasmine every two hours. Goodbye, Mrs. Wharton. Goodbye, Dr. G. So, 
Mrs. Wharton, dressed prettily, took parasol to hand and strolled down Charles Street. She walked slowly because of the heat and because Charles Street is a fashionable street and one is apt to meet many of one's friends and one is apt to stop and pass the time of day. Why, yes, Mrs. Becker. General Ketchum just fell right over, right there in my parlor. And she strolled some more. And to Miss Celia Bradshaw, an old friend of hers from picnic days, who she saw waiting on a corner. You'll never guess, Celia, who's dying in my house. At least I think he's dying. Dr. Chu wouldn't confess it, but I have a premonition. The general's dying. General, catch him. And at the druggist's, she took time to down a sherbet. Seltzer water was all the rage in Baltimore in this era, so she had a little of it with a squeeze of lemon. Then she walked over to the druggist and ordered... Tincture of yellow jasmine, sir. And while you're at it, I'd like some tartar emetic. I'm in pain. I hurt. Mrs. Horton, please, hurry. Mrs. Horton! Coming, coming, coming. And here we are. Oh, my stomach. The doctor said as soon as you drink this, you'll feel no pain. Please, please, hurry. Now, here, drink this. All of it? Every drop. Come on. Now, General, just a moment ago, you were begging for it. Now, every drop, all the way down, the whole glass. Uh, General, General, watch out. You'll fall out of bed. You... General, what's the matter? General, you look... Oh, General. The General was dead. Frontiersman, recruiter, quartermaster, dead on the floor. Fini to a military career. And it was then and only then that Mrs. Wharton had the vapors. about Baltimore, Maryland, of the era which concerns us. Even in the 1870s, it was one of the medical centers of the world. It is known as the home of the crab cake. Sidney Lanier, Edgar Allan Poe, Henri de Rochefort, alias the French butcher. And, as is well known, has given its name to a bird, the Oriole. It is a city of row houses and marble stoops and beautiful women. If from Baltimore, all the more, one of the rapier wits of the time had it of the beauty of the city's damoiselles. It is known that in her earlier days, Mrs. Morton met neatly the qualifications of the adage, and at 50, she was not to be sneezed at. However, at this precise instant, we may safely assume that the lady presented an appearance somewhat less than comely. For a general had just tumbled out of her bed and died. Right horror, dismay. But a few of the things this gentle lady must have experienced, and how nice could a gentle lady look under such circumstances. She was leaning against a bedpost, pressing her temples. From the front door. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wharton. Oh, Mr. Van Ness, quickly, come in. I look so pale. Look Look in my bedroom. 
What? Look in my bedroom. Uh, did you lose something or what? Please, do as I tell you. All right. Oh. He looks terrible, Mrs. Horton. He's dead. He can't be. Please don't be stupid, Mr. Van Ness. He's dead. He was ill and he died. But when I saw the general this morning, he looked so robust. You saw him this morning? Why? He came to check your accounts with me. Oh? As your solicitor, I was only too happy to, to discuss them with him. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what, Mr. Van Ness? That you were in the general's debt to the tune of $2,600. I paid him back immediately. Do you have the note you signed? Did he return it to you when you paid him? Why do you ask? He showed me a note this morning. He said he wanted his money. I knew nothing about it, so he said he would see you. He saw me. He tore up the note. Tore it up? Why? Did you pay him? No. He tore it up as a, a sailing gift to me. To see me happily on my way to Europe. Do you have any witnesses of the transaction? No. That is not good. Mrs. Wharton. Yes? There was a lady with the general this morning. Come to the window, Mr. Vanner. See? There. Where? There, under the Empress Eugenie Rose bush. Why, it's Mrs. Trubb. She imbibed. Well, she told me she never did. She said she was employed by the United States. As my solicitor, you must tell me. What shall be done now? I must tell you that I will have to report this of the $2,600. Of course you do. And you must be very distressed, Mr. Vanny. Yes. Yes, I am. Do sit down. I'll fetch you something to drink. All right. I'll only be a moment. Savannah, your favorite. Thank you. <clears throat> I am happy to report to you that Mr. Van Ness regained consciousness an hour later. He rose to his feet and looked about him. He was quite alone. Through a window, he could see the setting sun. He could also see Mrs. Wharton's rose garden. And in it, Mrs. Wharton, her arms about the waist of Mrs. Chubb, of the United States Department of the Treasury. And the two ladies were walking about the rose bushes. Whenever Mrs. Chubb would stumble, Mrs. Wharton would dab at her face with a handkerchief and assist her to her feet. Mr. Van Ness let his gaze drift from the bucolic scene and went immediately into the boudoir, where was the corpse of General Ketchum. Mr. Van Ness determined that that promissory note which he had seen earlier that day was not upon the general's person. So he took himself to the police and to them made charges. And the charges? Murder. But I murdered no one. The general took ill at my house as Dr. Chu. The general was sick, all right. I diagnosed it as Caramorbus recurrent type. General having been sickly in the Everglades. So you see... I didn't murder the general. Why should I? Because you owed him $2,600. He tore up the note as a gift. You were with him alone when he was dead. You could have destroyed the note yourself. And you call yourself a gentleman. And you call yourself a lady. I am a lady. I work for the United... Of course. She drank of the same wine that did the general. And you too, Mr. Van Ness. You got tipsy... And all that happened to her was a few scratches, thorns. Empress Eugenie Rosebush thorns. Well, uh, I don't know what came over me. Oh, there, dear, there, oh, there. You're so sweet, Mrs. Wharton. When you're in Baltimore, my house is your house. Murderess! <laughs> However, Mrs. Wharton was charged with suspicion of murder, and immediately a more detailed statement was taken from Dr. Chu. 
Color Morbus, recurrent type. More? Oh, when I was first called to attend General Ketchum, I found the sick man in a semi-comatose state. The pupils of the eye were of a natural size, but almost wholly insensible to light. When I prepared the dose of medicine, I found the general's teeth so clenched that it was a matter of considerable difficulty and adroit convincing to put it in his mouth. His furriness. Furriness, uh, gentlemen. The haziness of manner vanished almost immediately. I gave then Mrs. Wharton a prescription calling for a tincture of yellow jasmine. And the druggist was questioned. Oh, yes, I remember vividly the occasion. Mrs. Wharton entered my store, had a sherbet, some seltzer water over a dash of lemon for heat, tincture of yellow jasmine, and tartar emetic. A word about tartar emetic. It is a deadly poison. I use it externally for wrinkles. As did many ladies of the time. Next came the autopsy. The general's stomach was removed and examined. Two of the greatest internalists of the day, Dr. Williams and Dr. Aiken of the Maryland University, could not agree as to the causes of death by a superficial examination, so it was sent to a chemical laboratory at the Johns Hopkins University. And upon the analysis depended the fate of a lady who just wanted to go to Europe. <laughs> of course, the flagellation wasn't complete, but that's the way it happened. <laughs> All right, hand it to me. I'll put it through the filter. <laughs> Filtrate. Thank you. I'll wager Dr. Imhoff was astounded, wasn't he? <laughs> he thought he discovered something. He was prepared to call it the Imhoff effect. Attach this to the uh, hydrogen sulfide, will you? You know what? What? This is the closest I've ever been to a general. His stomach in an Erlenmeyer flask. I did a prima donna once, poisoned by a jealous mother. Arsenic she used. You should have seen the titration on that one. Precipitated. I'll get it. Here. You separate. I say no poison. I say poison for one dollar. How do we stand now? Mm, you owe me three from the last two analyses. So hand me the muriatic acid. Thank you. Ammonium sulfide? Oh, my. Orange red, Joe. Tartar emetic in the stomach, wouldn't you say? Tartar emetic? Chalk gives the same reaction. Plain, everyday chalk. That's the way my report is going to read. Chalk in the general stomach. <laughs> So they gave their report to the city solicitor's office, each different. One tartar emetic, the other chalk, which confused the city solicitor no end, for not one hour before he had read a report from another chemist, Professor R.S. McCullough. Professor McCullough, having examined a like portion of the general stomach, averred that not a trace of tartar emetic was to be found, nor chalk, but a bit of chicken Maryland. Confusion. The while, Mrs. Wharton, detained in prison, had a visitor. I bake these myself, dear Mrs. Wharton. Dear Mrs. Chubb. They're wrong about you, what they're saying. What are they saying? That you poisoned him. And others are saying that you would not, that you're too much of a gentle lady. Do you remember, dear Mrs. Chubb, when you came to my house, you drank from the same bottle as did the general? Did I? Of course you did. Remember? Wasn't it from another bottle I drank? And at a different time? <laughs> you, you are a tease, Mrs. Chubb. <laughs> Did I tell you there was no Mr. Chubb? I'm sorry. I'm so very sorry. Three years ago, he ate a bad crab. And you are alone, as I am. Oh, I dislike Washington. When we return from Europe, you'll come to live with me. Dear Mrs. Wharton, and I have something else to tell you. Professor McCullough examined the general's stomach. The professor said 
The general had not been poisoned. What transpired next, I have in a journal of the day. It is headlined with Doctors Disagree, Learned Men of Science at Variance, Several Schools of Thought. I quote, Dr. Reese, when interviewed, stated that General Ketchum died from cerebral spinal meningitis. On the other hand, Dr. Edward Warren stated that the general had not died from cerebral spinal meningitis. Dr. John R. McClurg attested that the general died of apoplexy from congestion. Dr. Abram Claude clings to the school of tartar emetic poisoning. And Dr. Josiah Simpson, dean of Baltimore Physicians, has made this statement. I believe the general died from natural causes. On December 4, 1871, the case went to trial. And possibly because of the conflicting testimony, Mrs. Wharton was acquitted. And thus it is that the true cause of the general's death is not known. Nor does history record whether Mrs. Wharton and her dear friend Mrs. Chubb ever got to Europe. But Mrs. Wharton's home, her abode wherein the general died, still stands. I expect you think I'll tell you that today the house is haunted. Well, it is, but not by the general. By Claude Forrester, who was the victim of an unsolved axe murder some 20 years later. The general has been forgotten. Until, I hope, tonight. General Ketchum, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program was transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Paula Winslow was heard as Mrs. Wharton and Russell Simpson as the general. Featured in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Bill Bissell, Sarah Selby, High Averback, and David Young. 